Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a quick announcement, we now have a private Facebook group, which is a nice place for you to meet like-minded people who are listeners of the show and readers of my book and talk about those things that are most important to us, you know, evidence of the afterlife, some help on grief and more importantly, how to live a powerful life while we're here on Earth. So if you're a Facebook user, just type in We Don't Die Listeners and join the group. So today on the show, it's a fun show because we have two guests. We have Nina Walsh and Ross Bartlett. Nina is a composer, performer, engineer, and producer. After spending some time doing some research, I found her music is incredible. Nina has been on her own journey finding evidence of the afterlife. Ross Bartlett is a medium who has an extraordinary gift that few people share. In fact, when he was 16 years old, he was the youngest known medium in the world. He's the author of the books, Heaven Therapy, Insights into the Afterlife, and Earth Angel, The Amazing True Story of a Young Psychic. And I'm excited to hear both of their journeys and why they believe we don't die, but also I hear that they're working on a project together. So Nina Walsh and Ross Bartlett, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hi. Hi there. Hi. This is fun. We're in three different locations, all connected via Skype. So it's the magic of the internet in 2017. And you guys are friends. How, how long have you known each other? I don't know when it was that we originally first got in contact, Nina. Do you remember? Been a while. Um, it was, it was, it was uh, oh, three years ago. Yeah. yeah, I would say around there. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It was after reading Ross's book. Ah. Um, and I'd been working on a lot of these frequency recordings and hadn't really found the right person to work with. And after reading his book, I just had to contact him. <laughs> and he replied. And um, yeah, that's kind of how this all started. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, maybe we can talk about that first, what the project is, and then, and then we can get into your individual stories of, uh, of afterlife. What do you mean by the, the frequencies? Well, I've, the been experimenting, I've been experimenting with um, binaural frequencies, um, or hemi-sync. Right. Um, for, for some time, which do you, do you, do you know anything about these recordings? About I, I do. It's left and right ear. You have your have headphones right. on, and by you offset the frequencies by a certain amount of hertz, and depending on how many hertz you're offsetting them, it will basically entrain your brain. Um, which will perceive a rhythm which isn't actually there. What it's doing is making up the difference between the two frequencies. Um, and it can entrain your brain into uh, an alpha state or a delta or a theta. Um, and I thought it would be great to be working with somebody that understood hypnotherapy with these. Um, and also my own personal <laughs> um journey into research in the afterlife matched perfectly what 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 ross was doing um and i really liked ross's approach that it was very evidence-based which you know being being the healthy skeptic that i am um it appealed to me it, it, it seemed like i had to work with ross so yeah. <laughs> sometimes you just know and healthy skepticism is so good um uh, and ross i hear you're known as being an extraordinary medium that's can be really specific in evidence. Is that correct? I try anyway, Sandra. You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever happens, happens. But of course, uh, yeah, right from the get-go, that's sort of what I, you know, always look to aim towards um, because I feel it has the most potential healing impact on on the clients that I work with and the people at the public events. Um, so I always sort of try to gear my style to being as evidential as possible. Yeah, maybe Ross, you can just continue with the microphone here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and even um, if you don't mind, you know, how you started with this, because I, I read somewhere on the internet that you were five years old when it first started. Yeah, that 
that's right um you know some of my first experiences of what you can you know consider a spiritual nature or paranormal transpersonal anomalous whatever term you wish to use um you know happened around about four or five years of age some of my earliest memories um and that was of seeing spirits and uh you know getting uh, psychic visions of events that would happen in the future um and then that sort of carried on through a lot of my childhood and around about the time I, I was sort of um between probably the ages of, of six to, to 13, I was also getting quite a lot of sort of physical related activity around in my home as well. So things being moved and um, all kinds of uh, happenings like that. And um, yeah, you know, I just kind of uh, got on with it really. Um, <laughs> what your I'm parents quite... <laughs> think of all this? Well, um I used to talk about it to particularly my grandmother who um, also lived at the same house um, I was living in when I was a child and and my mother as well and um, and they just sort of uh, reassured me really that it was nothing to be worried or concerned about and to just kind of you know go with the flow with it so to speak and uh, they didn't sort of label it in any way and say oh this is what you're experiencing or anything like that they just kind of let it evolve organically I guess um, my mother had been to see uh, different psychics and things actually before I was born um, she'd always had a sort of an interest in that side of things for a lot of her life and um, yeah it was just allowed to kind of be there I suppose and and I quite often ask you know did it did it scare you at all or was it freaky in any way and the answer I always have to give is actually no it wasn't because I was never really taught that I should be afraid of it or it was abnormal or freaky in any way and um I was a lot more concerned actually in, in my earlier years with um you know just being a child really and Pokemon was my generation actually <laughs> it happened so yeah, I just kind of got on with that, and, and that was just something that was kind of always there in the background, really. Yeah, well, to become a professional medium at some, such an age, did something happen that actually had you explore and then start doing, uh, you know, working with people? Uh, well, my grandmother passed away uh, when I was, uh, would have been around 13, 14, and um, then I started to sort of you know just question things a bit more you know is that okay you know is there an afterlife if there is how might that afterlife work or function in any way you know is my grandmother still aware of me in any sense and so on um so i actually went along uh, then to a, a spiritualist church uh, uh, with my mother and uh, and started getting a few messages from the mediums um and it, interestingly the mediums were you know they didn't know each other but they quite often would come and give me the basic the same sort of message in slightly different ways or one would fill in another part of a, a detail to the story of um, the experiences I had when I was a young child and that you know they happened for a reason and if I wanted to I had a certain natural sort of ability there or gift whichever you like to call it again and that I could maybe do something with it if I made that decision and apparently you did <laughs> yeah I ended up making that decision I mean I um I started meditating at first when I was uh, then at that age. Wow! Which basically shortly after that, and uh, had a load of really quick, strong, really vivid experiences, and um, was invited along after discussing those experiences to some other people in connection to um, the church. And that I was invited along to do sort of like a, a little development workshop to try and have a go more at refining you know, that ability that is there and uh, try and use it to give readings. Um, gave my first reading at that workshop to someone there. And then um, I got invited into a closed circle and uh, it all kind of happened very quickly from there. I was doing a lot of readings with that and they, the, the guy who was running it was organizing different readings for me to do to get a lot of practice in. And I actually ended up doing my first public demonstration of mediumship when I was uh, still 15 years of age. Wow. That's incredible. Do you remember what it felt like to correctly identify someone's loved one? A little bit strange at first, I would say. Yeah. Um, but, you know, once you very kind of quickly get used to it in, in, in sort of that whole communication between this world and the next, it really becomes second nature. And if anyone has been to see me at a demonstration or had a reading, it can kind of appear sometimes that, it's, it, you know, I'm really, as if someone's really there you know physically and i'm talking to them which isn't the case in terms of the physical aspect of it 
but it can look just as if it is and that's how natural it is to me in, in my mind and, and as I, I communicate with them really you know so it was a little bit strange at first um, but quite something quite moving really um, and indeed led me the more I did it it led me to make the decision that um, at 16 when we finish high school here in the UK that I was going to um, try and do that you know, as much as I could, um, and pursue that sort of as a full-time career, basically. Yeah, and you became known as the teen psychic. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, there's there's nothing like going to having a medium reading with specific evidence that you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that that's your, your person, and how healing that is. Yeah, well, um, it is immensely healing, you know, and for my, my eventual Master's of Science degree, um, that I did, which is in consciousness, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology. Wow. Uh, my thesis was um, ex- exactly looking at the healing potential for, you know, mediumistic readings to heal symptoms of grief caused by bereavement and actually the deep psychological working of, of that healing process and how it can go right, how it can potentially go wrong and everything that's involved um, that leads up to that, that process of healing and, and continual healing after that reading as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for taking that on in your life because it's so necessary. I mean, it's, you know, I, I figure most people, in fact, most of our listeners have found this show because they're grieving a loss of a loved one. And we all want very much to know that that our loved one is still around. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, um, I think, you know, what we're saying, you know, what, a lot of the data can suggest is everybody at some level wants to have that continual connection. It doesn't matter whether they come from a background of believing in some form of an afterlife or not believing in any form of an afterlife. Um, And even indeed those that kind of try to push away things to do with conceptions of the afterlife or mediumship and uh, the paranormal, um, there may even be in persons on the extreme end of that a a deeper need and want to um, reconnect with their deceased loved ones um, and there are certain signs of that that you can see in terms of uh, things that they do with their lives if again you kind of look into their, their behavior patterns and the psychology of things. Mm-hmm. And and how does hypnotherapy fall into uh, this? Yeah so that fell into place a little bit before uh, the master's degree and um, that was actually because um, a, a lady who, who ended up teaching me uh, she's a, a psychotherapist and a hypnotist and, and a very you know, amazing lady at what she does very very good at her work um, she saw me do a demonstration and we got speaking afterwards about different things and um, she suggested that you know hi- hypnosis might be a good way to go because I've begun to study a lot of um, psychology at that time of it and um, you know the the studying of hypnosis and, and hypnotherapy as a field is um you know you very much need to to learn aspects of psychology particularly some of the classical figures of psychology like your freuds and your youngs and your william james and so on Mm -hmm. and um you know she thought it'd be really interesting for me and could basically um add to and complement the work i'm already doing and um i felt the same um so i went along and uh you know ended up with a diploma in in hypnosis um hypnotherapy and have been practicing that since um I'm, I'm trying to think at what age i was when I, I did that i guess 18 was probably when i was kind of doing that it all seems a bit of a, a blur now i just turned 25 the other day so it's uh yeah even a little bit ago now yeah but not too long for us that are a little bit older life goes by no, so fast oh my gosh i was just recalling my 22nd birthday and now i t- just turned 51 it's like where did it go oh nina let's talk to you for a little bit how about would you like to share what got you involved Involved in researching the afterlife? Um, well, it's always been something that I've been curious about. Um, and I seem to have lost quite a lot of people from quite a young age that were very close to me. Oh, I'm um, sorry to hear that. It's tough. My very best tough. friend as a kid growing up, she, she passed um, when I, think I was 19. And then my best friend, Elisa... She passed on when, um, oh God, how was her daughter now? 17. So that was 17 years ago. Her daughter was uh, just a few months old. Um, and then my partner, who I knew had a terminal illness, uh, but because of my experience 
in the past with my friends. I wasn't afraid of however long we had together. Um, it, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to um, not have that experience. So it was very much part of our life. Uh, death, <laughs> which right. sounds a bit strange. So we did a lot of research and we experienced some quite crazy things, and we 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 came to some arrangements um, that when he did pass, he was going to communicate, um, which he did, and exactly the way that we'd 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 agreed. Really? That was, <laughs> yep, that was, that was to fuse my entire flat. Um, one of my last conversations with him was I don't want any of this flashing light rubbish I want the whole flat to go um uh, which is exactly what happened the whole flat went um all the lights was, went out is that what you're saying everything, the whole electricity went the entire flat and I was in the middle of typing a letter to his father in France and the whole place went and I just knew it was Eric and I said Eric what have you done I haven't saved that that I mean my bad French I've just attempted to write your father a letter and with that everything came back on again the computer included and there the letter was without saving it <laughs> that's wild so that was one of the crazy things that um <laughs> is it kind of verifies it for me um uh, so yeah, that's 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 Would kind you... of where it's been going since then. I, I, I mean, I've 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 since connected with people with like minds, and we've 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 gone to spiritualist churches, um, which is always a bit hit and miss. But was I always enjoy singing the hymns to those wonky tape recorders with the. With the <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you uh, about how you found out about physical mediumship and David Thompson is because I just needed more and more evidence I needed um you know even with with Eric fusing the flat and he also fused the flat at the same time of our biggest skeptic who was a friend friend of mine that used to live with me um and he phoned me and said uh is Eric okay there's disturbance in force <laughs> so I mean that was pretty pretty confirming for me but I still wanted more so I researched it and um booked in to sit with David Thompson yeah um, if you'd like to share that I, I spent a whole episode talking about when I went out to uh, Banyan Retreat Center and sat with two different physical mediums and uh you know it was, a, it was a crazy experience but very real and if you're if you're willing would love to hear it because I because Eric came through there as well well, yeah, he absolutely came through, much to my surprise. Um, you know, I was sitting there and they they normally split friends up. But for some reason, my friend Felix, um, who's my sister, Wu, we, we go on these, we explore things like this together. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a wild thing. So for our listener, this is a group of people sitting in a big circle and there's a, a medium that's in a cabinet uh, tied down to yeah. a chair so you know he's not manipulating anything and uh, voices come out of the complete darkness and well he's completely gagged yeah gagged oh absolutely so he's not throwing his voice but no. uh things move things fly around the room <laughs> voices <laughs> come from yeah. different well, places squeezing each other's hands quite tightly when the trumpets start flying like mm -hmm, uh -huh. we got here, you know and then I can't remember what's his his little helper. Uh, not uh, not not William. He's got a he's got a little helper that helps with the voice box. Um, I can't remember his name. I can't either. Timothy? No. no. Daniel? Timothy? Yeah, it's Timmy. It's, is Timmy. it Timothy? Timmy? 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 Yeah. 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 Well, he he says right. Okay, we're going to connect with with some lost loved ones. Um, we've got somebody over here that's that's. Trying to connect with a kind of a kind of wife, which is exactly how Eric and I used to explain ourselves. They'd be ask if we were married, um, you know, we're, well, kind of, sort of, um, and so it came through as a kind of wife. And I didn't say anything. And Felix, I felt it, Felix elbow. Yeah, like that's <laughs> you. Yeah. Um, okay, I've kind of got a husband in spirit. Yes, it's you, it's you. And then with that, we heard away from the medium, we heard Eric. We heard his name. He said Eric, um, which somebody else in the circle also heard. But the lady whose name I've also forgotten that was that was um, kind of conducting the circle that you're used to with David Thompson, 
She said, no, 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 that was subjective hearing. It's like, okay, okay. I did hear it and it has actually turned up on the recording. So it happened. Um, and as soon as my voice came through, then Eric came through uh, with a surge, an ectoplasmic surge, which just sounds like Ghostbusters or Doesn't something. Doesn't it, though? I was afraid to say <laughs> ectoplasm on the radio because I thought people are going to think I'm nuts. <laughs> It happened. <laughs> I remember when I got home, I wrote it all down and, and it, I reread it, and it looks so ridiculous that I finished it with "This did happen." <laughs> and then, anyway, after the ectoplasmic surge, <laughs> this voice was not near the cabinet; it was right in front of my face, and the people either side of me could hear very clearly. Everybody in the room could hear this very strong French accent. And it was Eric's voice, and, and you recognise, when you hear that voice, you recognise it instantly. When you've got such a strong connection with somebody, it's, I was, I was, I was actually quite embarrassed for some reason. Um, and I, I, I spoke to him in French, uh, c'est toi! Yeah. <laughs> and there was uh, another French girl in the circle, and she was laughing, she, she'd obviously seen this before, and she could hear it. Um, and I felt his hand on my face oh. and, the, and the voice got closer and his face, I could feel stubble on his face, which he had, he had a little gator beard and he said, I can hear, I can hear you excellent and I can hear your music, it's beautiful and my sweetheart and, I, I, and then, oh, what was her name, David Thompson's assistant. She kept encouraging me to talk because she could see I was a bit stunned. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, and you don't really know what to say. Like, hi, what's it like over there? <laughs> oh, it is it is so overwhelming. It really is. It, 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 and you can't believe, because your, your mind can't get around because this shouldn't be happening. This is just no, not. It really yeah. It, really, it does. It's, it's complete. Yeah. It complete spam my head out. And I managed to, you know, talk a little bit. Um, but it was, he had trouble coming through in the first place. He still made himself very clear, but we couldn't hold on to him for too long. Um, probably partly because I was a bit stunned by the whole situation, yeah. but it was very lovely. And he did give me a little kiss before he left. Oh, <laughs> that's so beautiful. Which everybody heard, but I, it's not the kind of thing I talk to my friends about because it just does, they'll, they'll probably commit me or something. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. I, I'm deathly afraid that some of my family members actually listen to this show and hear some of my experiences. If they do and they question me, fine. But if not, <laughs> well, I insisted on having a recording of the whole thing, yeah. and they didn't really want to give it to me at first, but I managed to get a recording. Unfortunately, it's only an MP3. I, if it was a if it was a WAV file, I could have compared the voice imprints, the actual waveform, oh. with words that I'd recorded of Eric while he was still on this plane. Um, but unfortunately, MP3s are so compressed, you get these big blocks of squares. So um, I urge the Banyan to start recording in WAV files and not MP3s. <laughs> yeah, and because I have heard people, not from David Thompson's seance, but from other people recording uh, that they have compared voices and, you know, something like 97% accurate as to the voices that come through, which is astonishing. Well, I have a recording, I sent it to you actually, of Eric saying yeah. the word when he was alive. And also the direct voice, and you can hear the pronunciation. You can you can hear the French accent. In. Yeah. Um, it'd be great to. I've tried to compare them as a waveform, but because it's an MP3, it's it's pretty impossible. Yeah. Can I attach this to this episode? Is that something you'd be willing to share? Just that uh, one. Yeah. 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 Just that. Just that one. Just that one um, clip with the name. If you want the other ones, then you'll have to get you'll have to get onto um, David Thompson's crew. Yeah. No. That's it's too much effort um, for me right now <laughs> everything going on but i'm so grateful that you not only could hear but you could you could feel his face and the stubble and you got a kiss i mean that's yeah. magical yeah yeah it was pretty mind-blowing oh ross if we can go back to you a little bit and talk sure. about this afterlife because uh besides just uh doing medium readings you've done some research into um i believe you have anyways about our existence in the afterlife and, and what makes it possible for these medium 
these people to be able to come through. Do you have any insight you can share on that? Yeah, I mean, with my second book, um, Heaven Therapy, and uh, you know, insights into the afterlife. Um, I try to basically within that book, you know, um, see if we can just bridge a little bit between, uh, bridge the gap between science and mysticism uh, and see where the two can maybe have the same underlying understanding of reality. Uh, so throughout that book, wherever I, I try to talk about something, uh, you could say mystical, um, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I then try and look at, you know, the science we have available today and and see where, you know, I can relate any of that science to the mystical experience and, you know, vice versa. And uh, if you look at various elements of science within psychology and biology and um, and also particularly in the area of quantum physics, well, there's a lot there that could be interpreted to suggest, um, Getting close. <laughs> you know, that you know, p- things people have been saying for a long, long time, you know, mystics that have been going back even thousands of years, the things that they've been saying are actually maybe um, spot on in various ways. And um, in terms of the mediumistic connection process, um, I do try to explain that in the book um, about energy and um, information being exchanged from um, a certain, you know, grouping of atoms to an another if you like in subatomic particles and how that process might be involved um in the exchange of of telepathic information basically so i'm just in that book delving into those areas in a very light way um for more of a sort of a popular audience basically and uh uh, writing about some of the things i wrote about um in more academic terms um in my master's degree and now i'm currently doing a phd in mental health and psychology um and that is the the thesis there is focused around out-of-body experiences uh, because I want to go in basically a direction of seeing if we can potentially detect um, the mind um, outside of the body Um, and if we can do that you know maybe um, there's a way within that process that can be adapted to actually us having um, you know empirical objective communication with the afterlife through a sort of a a text message system if you like in the end and that's sort of my own research goal and uh, some of the foundations of that um, I hopefully will begin to put in place throughout the PhD. Oh I'm so excited for you doing that. I mean when you think of it's 2017 now and how far we've come so fast and you know there's when I first got into this world of the afterlife I had no idea of the people that are also researching And what's being done. And, you know, you talk a little bit about the quantum level. I had the opportunity to interview uh, Dr. Alan Huguenot, uh, who is a physicist. And he was talking about the atoms and everything on the quantum level. And I'm glad you write in, like, layman's terms, because so much of what he said, I... I didn't get my brain just couldn't get around <laughs> except for I I knew there was something real happening and and uh and so I'm very excited about this and where it's all going I'm, and I'm you know I think this is just the beginning of a of a friendship that I get to support you uh both actually in what you're up to and share cuz this is information that needs to be out in the world. Uh Ross one more follow-up question on this is you know a lot of people are uh, definitely, as am I, missing some loved ones in in the hereafter. Do you have a sense of what it's like there for them? Uh, well, yes, when I we do, cross in over, short. okay. And and that is, you know, very much um, in in short everything we have here, and indeed more. You know, I'm often asked questions like, you know, can they communicate easily with each other there? Do they see each other like we see each other here? And the answer is, is yes, they do. And they can see and experience each other's each other visually, um, emotionally, um, in ways that we can't hear, as as we are in a sense hindered by the processing of the physical brain, the physical body, um, and its constant 
um, interaction uh, with the physical environment. So if you like, our mind is being constantly fed information from the physical vibration, um, which blocks out information from the other realms. Um, and uh, when we show the physical body, um, we can experience all the things we did in the, the physical, but also these things that, you know, most people go throughout their lives never experiencing necessarily in the physical body, or if they do, it's it's very short, very fleeting, and that's it. Um, and, you know, the reason sometimes people find it difficult to make this, this crossover between, well, how can we get from this physical to this non-physical aspect of existence? And uh, it's generally because they don't really have so much of an understanding of, of, yes, while this world is physical in terms of our terminology, um, the world is anything but physical um, as it happens. You know, it's it's all energy vibrating at one level or another. And we look at things like touch, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, technically, we in the way we generally um, today in the Western world think we, we touch each other, um, it is not how we do at all. It's not a, a physical contact per se. What is happening there, for example, is as the atoms of, of your body and the other person's body get within a very close position to each other, um, they actually repel each other. Um, and it's that um, but information is exchanged um, within that process, the friction of, of that um uh, those atoms and uh, you know that are coming together and it's that that um, energy exchange um, that the body and the brain the mind processes as a physical touch um, but for instance as I sit on this chair for instance right now I'm technically um, floating just slightly above the chair at a subatomic level we're talking about here um, so it's a very very minuscule amount of, of floating you take um, but yeah, we're technically, you know, not physically touching in the way we, we believe we are ever. So when you actually gain that knowledge, that already makes you start to sort of, oh, OK, maybe I can understand this non-physical element to existence more because I'm kind of living that on a day to day basis already. And I'm sure our eyes aren't seeing the way we think they're seeing either. Uh, right. The whole way we. Yeah. Well, that's that's all about light coming into um, the eyes, you know, and then um it sends signals then, you know, from the information that it receives and that light goes to the brain, actually the back of the brain and um, the brain then goes, oh, this is what it looks like out here. Um, and two interesting facts about that is we actually take that information in upside down um, due to the reflective element as the light's reflecting back to us. The information is upside down and our brain actually flips it the right way up. Wow. Um, and also that process um, takes uh, about a tenth of a second to happen. So we're technically, our, our visual spectrum, for instance, is a tenth of a second behind actual reality, which is obviously a very, very small amount. Um, but we're always technically um, behind uh, what is actually going on in, in the world, in reality, whatever that might be um, outside of us in this sense, as we perceive it anyway, we're a tenth of a second behind the, the goings on in front of us. Mm, I remember somewhere reading that, you know, we're made up of cells and then molecules and then atoms bouncing around inside there. And if we took a teeny tiny little uh, camera and put it inside one of the atoms, it, it would just show nothing. I mean, there's just, there really is no, down to the tiniest level, there is no substance. There is no stuff. Well, it is energy, it, I mean, right? that that continues to, yeah, just basically puzzle science as to, you know, this thing of, well, you find the next smallest particle and then the next smallest one, and then you can kind of go on infinitely, you know, uh, it, it, theoretically. That's what science would suggest. And it's like, well, okay, so what are we made of? Okay, cells. What are the cells made of at a, a, a yeah. small level? Atoms. And they're made of, of, of smaller subatomic particles, but then it's what are they made of? Okay, maybe they're made of vibrating strings of energy. Okay, well, where do they come from? Right. And this sort of process kind of carries on. But I, I do offer... Uh, somewhat of an answer to that actually uh, in in my my book heaven therapy as to to how in essence uh, something could have seemingly come from nothing which is you know been um, a big constant question within philosophy and science um you know from the very beginning of you know time mm, it's incredible and so everything that we can see and smell and taste and hear and touch you know we're just picking up on energy right 
Yeah, hundred percent. Just different combinations of that, and you know, you can look at a stone, for instance, and you know how there might be different colours, um, and that's a combination of different minerals in the stone. Um, but those minerals are a combination of various other things at a smaller level again, and you can just continue to trace that back, basically, like I say, to the subatomic level, and then then further down, you know, into other areas that are you know still very much arguably unexplored um, by science today. Yeah, you know, I'm not a of science mind and don't really understand a lot of it. However, I do know that around me right now there's you know, it's my Wi Fi, wireless internet signal floating around. There's television signals. My GPS is picking up on something. Right now I've got a wireless uh laptop that's connecting to the both of you. My iPhone isn't plugged into anything and it can get pictures from God knows what satellite from somebody else. And if all that's possible happening in this invisible space, why not us, you know, the computers in our mind, uh, or you, you know, brilliant medium, why not be able to pick up uh, energy from someone who is no longer physically on this earth? Like, it, that makes sense. It does. I, I mean, the main the main question with that, and this is, again, what I'm sort of doing in, in my book is, you know, we're looking at, the mysticism of science so we're saying you know there's an afterlife um but then you know why might there be an afterlife how does that consciousness survive the process of physical death and you can look at you know for me two particular things within science today one is um the first law of thermodynamics that says energy can't be created or destroyed it can mm. only change forms so that part of you that does make up that that consciousness at some level um will not just cease to exist altogether nothing of you will ever cease to exist altogether it might transform in into some other you know form of energy and source but it's still there somewhere and then we have theories within science today that would allow for um the the, the, your consciousness to to exist outside of uh, your physical body and potentially indefinitely one theory um for any of those out there that that are more scientifically minded you could say um uh is uh, orco r theory um which is a theory put together by an anesthesiologist from america what's it called can you say that again or or well, it's um, it stands for orchestrated objective reduction. So it's easier okay. to figure orchestrated okay. than that. Um, orchestrated but it's, it's reduction. A theory, yeah, theory. Okay. Orchestrated objective reduction. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it um is basically a theory within quantum physics um that suggests consciousness is happening um at a, a deeper level um than what mainstream thought has been so uh, mainstream thought suggests consciousness arises due to a certain level of complex neuron electrical activity basically um, but they're saying in this theory that it's actually going on at a, a smaller level in terms of scale um, in something called the microtubules of the body um, and the neurons are absolutely full of these things um, and they basically, you could almost say they effectively uh, make up the neuron, um, a bit like cells of your body make up, you know, the bigger part of the picture of you. Right. Uh, these microtubules make up the bigger picture of a neuron and um, that it's happening with inside uh, those parts of the neuron at a deeper level um, and is actually happening at the quantum level that um, your consciousness is information contained within energy um, at the quantum level of existence and these microtubules basically act as a gateway for that quantum mind of yours to function through the physical body and vice versa the physical vibration the physical stimulus to come into the physical body and for that physical body to take that connect it to the information in your your consciousness your mind at that quantum level and then formulate an opinion on that physical environment um, around you that theory has been around since 1992 and it's been refined slowly over the years and, you know, more experiments have been done that um, arguably add to to weight to validating that theory. And um, as I said, it was put together by an anesthesiologist in America, um, Arizona, America, called um, Hammeroff. Yeah. Epigenetics. And, Epigenetics, and, um, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. That, sorry? It, it sounds like a similar... 
part of the epigenetics. Have you, have, have you looked much into epigenetics where we have these unique receptor um, proteins in our cells that are literally downloading our experience as, as Nina Walsh, as Ross Bartlett, um, just like a TV set is receiving signals. Um, but it's, 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 it's largely down to the environment of what's coming in, what's being received. And in ourselves, like throughout our body, not just in our memory and our mind. Yeah, yeah, through every, through all the cells in our body, particularly around the heart. Um, there is one school of thought that says the heart is what does our thinking. Um, the head does the processing. Uh, but it sounds similar to what you're you're, you're saying about the about the microtubules, how it's it's about the environment, and um, yeah. This is a good conversation. Um, <laughs> not, not too sure where to go, except for it, it. I'm just getting the instinct to ask uh, Ross just this question: Is there something we can do if we're not mediums to still be able to maybe hear or get in touch with our loved one? Well, the project I'm work, you know, have been working with Nina is effectively in part geared towards that. Um, in the sense of it, it's a tool for people to potentially use to try and get in as ideal space and as an efficient space as possible, mentally speaking, um, to be able to pick up on in various ways and, and, and potentially communicate with their loved ones around them uh, who, have, who have passed over. Um, and indeed, maybe other things around them, you know, energy around them in the room they're in, in, in the location, so on and so forth. Um, mediums train our minds, you know, a lot to try and get into um, those such states um, and be able to stay in that such state as efficiently as possible, as strongly as possible for a time period that we need to um do so you know, if we're doing a reading and the reading's half an hour for that half an hour um so on and uh this is trying to help the regular person and people who are mediums people that have you know been uh looking to train maybe to become a medium as well to get a stronger connection as as is currently capable um for them with their those other you could say other vibrations other realms around them including their their loved ones and such Nina, when this is done, what, what do you see for foresee it? I mean, would it be an audio that we could download and then we put on a set of headphones and go on our own? Would it be just music? Would it be like a guided journey? What do, what do you think? Oh, no, it's, a, it, it, it's a guided journey. I mean, it's it's it, the whole process of it is still really at its a very experimental stage. That's okay. Um, it's, it's coming. It, yeah, it's coming, but the research is needed, which is why um, I've been working with Craig Hogan as well from um, the Centre of Spiritual Understanding. Was that? I can't remember. He's, 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 a few things going. he's part yeah. of the Arizona. Afterlife Arthur. Research Education Institute is what. Yeah, it's yeah. and I yeah. recorded some binaural beats for him, and um, he's been using that in his research. So. We just need as much coming back of it as possible because it hasn't really been heavily researched. I think the Monroe Institute are probably the leading research institute on this, and they've been doing it for some time. Um, but there's all kinds of avenues this could go down. There's 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 a lot of potential for for um, neurological research, for physical research. Um, there's yeah, I mean it, it's huge potential. What I am personally interested in is the same. As, as Ross and that is with with um, connecting with other dimensions and finding whether you know there's much evidence th that we can that this this is possible and if we can get someone that isn't a medium to for this to work then then great we have we, we, we have some pretty strong evidence <laughs> and Craig Hogan is already getting results like that I know I was part of his trials which is how how I actually came to meet Craig um, Fantastic. My skeptical head, I went through the whole stage, five stages, and, and, and did start to make some quite crazy connections, which is why I then offered the binaural beats, saying, Look, hey, try these, because this, this, this could enhance the whole process. Um, and it seems to. Um, and yeah, this is, what, this is what the mission that Ross and I are on, is, is to develop this further. 
And I think Ross has already been, he started to use them in development circles, haven't you, Ross? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, and, and with some of the workshops that I do in trying to take people that are various levels, quite often you complete novices or at a very early stage, and, um, and try and teach them to, again, and tap into um, their connection around us. Um, and one of the things I, I talk about in my book is that everybody innately has that connection to varying degrees. Um, and and about, it's about, you know, trying and, and practice and, and such, because, I mean, it's a bit like anything. Everyone um, can maybe play a few keys on the piano, but they're not going to be the next Beethoven, for instance, you know. Um, uh-huh. But everyone has that connection. Um, and I believe everyone is capable of tapping into it um, to a level that, that is actually reasonable if they put in the effort and time and they have the right guidance. And effectively what you know these recordings will do is, is we're taking different areas that have been scientifically observed to produce um, altered states of consciousness um, that can um, lead to different anonymous experiences like the perception of uh, spirits. Um, which is there with hypnosis, it's there with binaural beats, um, and it's there in the meditative techniques that are used by mediums. And in these recordings, we're combining those areas together, um, hopefully as efficiently as possible, um, to try and give you know the, the strongest element of induction um, to an individual um, to get them to that point where they're able to sit down, put it on, and, and they are picking up on and feeling things. Um, and, you know, and then the more they do it, I can assure you, the stronger they'll get it as well. Um, and, and that's how anyone develops as a medium, in fact, really. Um, and with these recordings, yeah, you know, the, there's, I've seen quite interesting results in, in how I've used it um, so far. And, as Nina touched on there, in similar ways with similar recordings and practices, um, academic and outside of academia, um, people are finding interesting results, you know. So it's just sort of following through in this way and and seeing with, you know, using my skills, using Nina's skills, putting that together, um, what is the best package we can create for people that gets them to that place they need to be. Mm, It's really spectacular. I know for myself, uh, and I've just started on my journey uh, into mediumship. So I know it's in there. I know it's in my mind. I know I've accurately described people's loved ones and such, but I can find, I can feel myself wanting to be really great at it before I even start practicing, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's, it from what you're saying, and it, it just totally makes sense. It takes commitment, dedication, practice. It is an altered state you're, you're getting into. Uh, so it's not, because it, I know there's many people that just, they want things to happen like yesterday, fast, you know, I'm one of those people. Mm. And, and I'm just really getting, it's a commitment and training the mind. And now hearing that, you guys are creating something that will make it possible in the future to get our minds there uh, in, a, in a quicker time. And, and it's like a muscle you're building, sort of, right? Indeed. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help in that process. If you want to become a professional medium, it is going to take a lot of time. It's sure going it to is. take a lot of dedication, you know. Um, but with these these methods, for instance, you know, you can sit someone down potentially and they've never never even done anything before, and they, they go through these processes. You know, they listen to the, the meditations that I would do before doing a reading, for instance. They, they're they lulled into the right frame of mind right. in their brain, the right sequence and the right frequency through the binaural beats. So that's helping them. The hypnotic suggestions are helping them. And they get into that place, and, and very quickly they're able to surprise themselves in detailing accurate information regarding person's deceit loved ones at a rate higher than chance something that you know is is very rare in terms of academic settings you know um there's people out there that have done it consistently you know there's some work out there in in the Wimbridge institute in arizona which is very fruitful in terms of mental mediumship and and that being you know uh 100 genuine where the mediums are getting information at a rate significantly higher than chance in things like double blind conditions where you know they don't have any contact and knowledge with the recipient of the information so it's 100 genuine what we're trying to do with these recordings is basically speed up that process in a sense and give the average person um this experience of of being there and connecting 
thing and coming out with this information about somebody you know sat across from them say that relates um and indeed they can get that from themselves potentially as well with messages from their loved ones um and it gives somebody somebody the average person can go away at home and connect with and maybe receive a little message that they can be um, confident in and, and get reassurance from it um, than having to go see a medium all the time because it, it's just impossible and practical. Um, so it gives them that thing on their own. Wow. As well. um, and I think that's part of the goal. I'm of really you know, Nina can put excited. her yeah. five cents in there as well if she wants to, you know, um, and add anything that she, she might want to add. But, you know, I, I, I think that's where I come from with it. And, and I think that's, you know, where, where we're, we're trying to head with aspects of it, certainly. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I had been working with a couple of other people before, but they were kind of more inclined to go for the uh, stop smoking and lose weight kind of approach. Right. It doesn't really interest me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, I, think, I think Ross and I are on the same page with this. <laughs> wow. What is your timeline? I mean, is this something you think it'll take a few years to do within a year? Well, what, what do you think? Pretty, three days already. Um, they're going to need a bit more tweaking, I think. You wanted to revoice some of them, didn't you, Russell, or, or parts of them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, again, it's but, but by having a, a, um, the workshops that Ross can use these in, then you can we can refine it. Yes. And, and we'll know when, when, they're, when they're finished. Um, but we're not far from having the first series. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see where it leads on from there and which ones, you know. Yeah. to be having really positive effects and, sure. and, and take yeah. it as we go, really. Yeah. I mean, after you've, you've got that in place, you know, where it'll be, you know, probably doing a couple of studies, you know, where, you know, we people listen to these recordings and you see what results they get. You know, are they getting those connections and can we, you know, make it as... Um, you know, empirical as possible in the sense of, you know, do we again seem to be getting accurate information coming through um, at a rate significantly higher than chance that people aren't going to know about and things like that. So, you know, if we've got that and the studies coming in, then that's when, you know, you're really making some ground. And those are studies that I could potentially do as a psychologist or indeed other people can can do. And I know Nina's, you know, been, um, you know, working with, um uh, Mr. Hogan there across across the water again, mm-hmm. so across the pond, as they say. And you know, with that, um, it could be someone like him or many others that are involved in in, in the research process of you know taking these recordings and um, scientifically studying their effects, basically. Um, and, and that will be the next step once everything is is 100 in place with the the recordings themselves and then you know indeed potentially getting them out to the, the general population in different ways outside of maybe just my workshops and things mm, oh i know a whole bunch of people that'd be interested in them <laughs> so i'd love it if the two of you keep in touch with me because uh when they're ready or even if you need some people to practice this and see what the results are uh there's i know I have a great amount of people that would be interested in something just like this uh, because we're all looking and even for myself who knows in my heart that life after death is real to be able to put on a set of headphones and go through a guided imagery and reconnect with my dad, my grandmother, whomever. uh, Gosh, that is a million dollar experience right there. Uh, So I applaud both of you for taking this on and I'm really excited to see where it goes and how it develops and being able to use it myself and share it with people. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really exciting. Yeah. It is very exciting. And for our listener who's listening right now, uh, currently we're recording this in June, 2017, but past that, uh, you know, this technology might be, ready so i want you to keep if you're willing um these episodes will stay on youtube probably forever i hope um, but just scroll down in the description because as soon as these audios go live i'll have a link to how you can uh, get it for yourself so that's wonderful Do, can i just get a couple of closing words from both of you just oh any final things you want to say or if there's a little inspiration that you want to leave us with today um that'd be all right do you want to 
I don't think I, I, this isn't anything new. I think there's always been this quest. Um, you know, you look at Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison. They were they were they were trying to develop telephones that speak communicate with spirit. Yes. Um, I think I think I think we're we're, we're carrying on a, a strong tradition here. Um, but with the aid of technology, hopefully we will get there, and it will get out to the to the greater masses. Yeah, thanks, Nina. And can people um, go to your website and just see who you are and listen to your music a little bit? Uh, they can, but it's so completely out of date. Um, that's what happens when an artist runs their own website. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you can YouTube or SoundCloud, Woodley Research Facility is one of my projects. Nina Walsh, um, I have an album, Bright Lights and Filthy Nights, which is the more folk thing, and Fireflies. Facebook's normally a good place to get me as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I really need to up my website. <laughs> no, okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. And Ross, how about you? Closing words? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think I'd echo what Nina said. Uh, and also that, you know, you know, people that are listening to this, they might feel a bit you know on their own within this but what, what I want to say is you know whatever experience you're in life someone has gone through and is going through something similar and you know you might think at times you're a bit crazy you know or you know following something through that you know you're wanting hope and you know and, and it is out there for you you know and if you haven't had that that proof of of the afterlife yet then to to keep being you know to keep searching because it will be there and and it, and it is life-changing um, just, you know, try your best to go about it in, in the right channels and, and it will come for you, you know. And um, in terms of me, you know, you can get hold of me at my website, which is www.rosswbartlett.com or Facebook is, again, a really good way of, of getting hold of me, you know, and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about anything that was brought up in the interview today or outside of the interview as well that they could have. So, um, you know, by all means, be in touch. Wow, you both left me just so inspired. And you know, something that just resonates so true for both of you is not only are you on this research uh, and you want to learn, and but the most important thing is you want to share and you want to make a difference in other people's lives. And what a gift that is. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And for our listener, thank you for taking the time to listen. This has been, for me, another great conversation. I hope it's uh, you've enjoyed it as much as I have had. Left us a lot to think about. And uh, in this invisible world around us, boy, there is there's everything. Everything, you know, really everything. So I'm, I'm actually excited to re-listen to this episode. So this is, <laughs> this is one of those. So... Also, for uh, you, our listener, feel free to go to we don't die radio.com. That's where all the past episodes are stored. Uh, most of the places you listen to them, they only store the last hundred, but we are up to, gosh, 170 something, so quite a few. And uh, we were talking about Craig Hogan during this episode. He is the president of the Afterlife Research and Education Institute, and they're having their big sympo- symposium this coming September 15th through 17th, 2017 in Scottsdale, Arizona. And you can find out the, the cutting edge things of what's happening in the world of the afterlife at that conference. And you can go to afterlifestudies.org to find out more and register. And I will be one of the speakers, so you can meet me in person. And also, you know, feel free to go to Facebook and type and we don't die listeners and become a part of our private community supported group and who you are and what you're up to in your life you know know that you are loved so in closing my name is sandra champlain and i've been your host on we don't die radio and i do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important so i want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon